much for being here tonight. Um, what a great area to be able to use. Thank you so much, Maui Ocean Center, for letting us use this sphere for our monthly um, presentation. So you're here with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, and we have these meetings on the first Wednesday of every month. Um, my name is Jill Wirt, and I'm a graduate student at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara, specializing in coastal marine resource management. Um, so I'm here on Maui for the summer, working with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council as part of um, an internship requirement for my program. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give you all a few updates on what Maui Nui Marine Resource Council has been working on over the past few months. So if you're new here, uh, we are a community-based organization working to find science-based solutions to challenging problems impacting our coral reefs. Our vision is healthy coral reefs, clean ocean water, and abundance of native fish for the islands of Maui County. Um, sediment runoff has that causes brown water events has become an issue across Maui's coastlines, um, including Ma'alaya Bay, so just outside of the Maui Ocean Center here. And m and MRC is working to improve ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay through our Vision for Pohokea project. Um, we will be installing oysters in cages here in Ma'alaya Harbor um, to utilize the filter feeding capabilities of these wonderful mollusks to help remove pollutants from the water. Um, we're currently seeking volunteers to help us on this project. So that will include making sure, uh, monitoring the oysters, making sure they are all healthy, including um, cleaning their cages as well. So all of these projects can't happen um, without our wonderful volunteers. So if you want to be part of that, it's a very um, exciting new project happening this October. You can sign up at the table um, before you head out today. On the Malthus side of the um, projects, we have been working to implement and source additional funding for the multi-year projects of the Poakea Watersheds uh, Stormwater Plan, which you can download and view on our website at mauireefs.org. So prior to um, placing the oysters in the harbor, we have um, been conducting water quality assessments using our water quality monitoring probe. Um, our lead scientist, John Starmer, and programs manager, Amy Hodges, have been using that probe and kayaking around Ma'alaya Harbor um, to gather, um, executing the first transects within the harbor um, to gather that water quality data. So this is actually one that I got to do in July. Um, it shows the turbidity or the water clarity in uh, the harbor, so the darker the circles um, means it's more turbid or more murky, and then the lighter circles um, are indicating the, that the water is more clear. So this is all gathering data prior to putting the oysters into the harbor. Um, we also have our Hui Okavai Ola, um, our community-based ocean water quality monitoring program that monitors 39 locations around West and South Maui. Um, we recently held two community events to share our findings um, in South and West Maui. And we've also added two new Ma'alaya sampling sites to the Hui Monitoring Program. And MNMRC has begun collecting nutrient samples at additional sites throughout the harbor to help establish a baseline data before those oysters go in. Um, these site locations will be adjusted and refined as results return from the Oahu Analytical Laboratory. And um, our ocean water quality team presented about West Maui results at a presentation on July 30th in Lahaina last week. Um, if you miss this presentation over in West Maui or on South Maui, those all can be viewed on the Akaka Community Media's website. So if you're curious about what the water looks like where you live and what we're finding, go check out those presentations. They're very interesting and thorough. For upcoming events, our next Wednesday meeting will be September 4th here at the Sphere from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And we'll have Paul Brubaker, principal of TZ Economics, which is a statewide economics consultancy based in Honolulu. Um, he is the former senior vice president and chief economist at Bank of Hawaii. Brubaker is known for his insights about current trends in Hawaii's economy and economic forecasts, and he will be speaking about over-tourism in Hawaii. 
um, specifically about managing tourism and the impacts to our local economy versus the health of our local environment and quality of life. So if you have not signed up for our newsletter, our Reef and Brief newsletter, that gets sent out um, on a monthly basis and contains links to reserve seats for our monthly presentation. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, you can sign up here at the table after the presentation. That way you'll be the first to know um, to reserve those seats for that, for that talk. Um, additionally, not on here, but we have a Know Your Ocean speaker series. Um, we are going to be bringing Nainoa Thompson in October for a talk, so that will also be announced and tickets will be for sale through a Reef and Brief newsletter. Um, we don't have dates or locations set in stone yet. Um, and then same for, we are hoping um, to confirm Sylvia Earl for November. So yes, we definitely want to get tickets and be in the know for that because um, really great ocean speakers. Okay, finally, we are a um, nonprofit organization and we do rely on your support for our work. So if you would like to become a member, you can make a donation of $25 or more. A $50 donation gets you this beautiful tote bag that has a zipper on top. And you can take it to the beach, it's great for everyday use. Um, and you, or you, so you can join at our table here or you can join online at uh, MauiReefs.org. Um, so we also especially welcome monthly donations, which it's easy for you, and it helps us budget better. So again, if you can't make monetary donations and you want to support us in other ways, you can follow us on social media like our pages, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we try to stay active and involved in all the current events. And volunteer, yes, of course. <laughs> Um, we're always looking for volunteers for all of our projects with Julio Caviola and our oyster project, which is coming up. So finally, I will now introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Stephen Bussinger. Um, he is the professor and chair of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Hawaii. He has made notable contributions to the atmospheric sciences in several important yet diverse areas. For the past 30 years, Professor Stephen has been active in researching the evolution and structure of destructive atmospheric storms, resulting in fundamental contributions to our understanding of the formation of storm systems in cold air streams and in the tropics. To date, he has over 80 peer-reviewed journal publications, published two academic textbooks, and seven book chapters. Um, and Dr. Bussinger was elected Fellow of the American <coughs> Meteorological Society in 2010. He is an AMS certified consulting meteorologist, and in 2011, he received the UH Manoa Chancellor's Citation for a meritorious teaching. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Bussinger. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. No, I have to live up to it, I guess. Um, so I'm, as you kind of could gather, uh, not an ocean scientist. I'm a meteorologist or an atmospheric scientist. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, hazardous weather. One of the other uh, topics that I think would be really fun to talk about is ocean safety and, uh, <coughs> and wave forecasting. <coughs> yeah, well, uh, we have to start on a, a little bit lighter note, I guess. <coughs> You're looking at Maui by 2100, and these guys are uh, rubbing their fins together. To get a little bit more on a serious note, I, I want to talk about uh, the hazardous weather that affects our islands and talk a little bit about global warming and if there's a link between the two and how that link might work. <coughs> so, um, this is a little video. Uh, I'm going to start it off and, and hopefully, I don't know if you can turn that up from your end or whether I Hopefully you can hear it. 
Ah, right. What we expect to be a solid mass of ice is actually in constant motion. As researchers continue to seek a deeper understanding of this region, new information about how sea ice changes is coming to light. In this animation, we're taking the Arctic sea ice into the third dimension. Here, we're looking at the ice age, which is an indicator of thickness. Generally, polar ice is thicker ice. That's the choice of Dr. Walt Meyer. Senior research scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. You can see the, the date on the upper left. In the end, with the season. In winter, the ice grows out and expands outward. In summer, it contracts inward as it melts. You see the whiter ice, which is the older ice, moving around in the Arctic, being pushed around by winds and currents that move the ice. Over the years, the ice pulses around and moves around towards the top along the coast of Greenland. The older ice eventually moves out of the Arctic and into the North Atlantic where it melts. The ice gets replenished within the Arctic because some of the ice survives each summer and grows older. And particularly in the region north of Alaska called the Beaufort Sea, where the ice spins around in a clockwise direction called the Beaufort Gyre. And that ice can keep spinning around oftentimes for several years and gradually getting older and thus getting thicker. Eventually, the ice would spin out of that gyre and go out through Fram Strait. In the past, we've always had enough ice growth and ice aging, enough ice surviving the summers to replenish the older ice that's lost. But in recent years, we've seen less replenishment. There's been more melt during the summer, so the ice that goes out through Fram Strait has not been compensated by the ice growth. In addition, especially in recent years, we've seen some pretty remarkable things in the Beaufort Sea, where that area that used to be a nursery for the development of the older ice allowed the young ice to age and mature. What we've seen instead is the ice is now more broken up, more scattered, and that's allowing the older ice to melt within the Beaufort Sea. So we're seeing the Beaufort Sea go from a nursery to a graveyard for older ice. As we get towards the more recent years, much of that oldest ice, the ice that's older than five years old in the bright white, is almost virtually disappeared from the Arctic Ocean and the Arctic is now dominated by younger and thinner ice. I, th I think that it's, uh, some of you may have seen that already, but I think it's really profound that our world is changing to the degree that it is. And these are observations uh, which are hard to refute. And they have large implications for the energy um, the energy input and output from the climate system. Because if you have bright white snow and ice, you reflect a lot of radiation. But if instead you have open water, you absorb a lot of radiation. And I think you've probably seen the record temperatures in Europe and Alaska and uh, Russia this summer. In fact, July was uh, a record warm July for Kahului. Uh, so it's been kind of hot here too. <clears throat> anyway, uh, what this graphic here shows is the gradual decrease in the ice extent, and then in recent years it has really gone up and down, uh, the ice extent, and, uh, and that's a reflection of the fact that you have thinner ice, which in the summertime melts way back. So those, those uh, large excur excursions downward are the thinner ice melting in the summer. And we are once again this summer uh, breaking records in terms of how small the ice extent is this, this year. <clears throat> what I'd like to do though is, is talk a little bit about severe weather. And this was an interesting storm that uh, happened last February. It's called a Kona Low. And uh, 
it brought very cold temperatures, very strong winds, and very uh, low snow levels on uh, Haleakala. You may remember this little event, and it's uh, kind of a nice uh, graphic here. This is a satellite loop, uh, and the blue colors are, are cold cloud tops. And this was um, a little video that I took driving around Maui. I can't remember what I was doing here. Uh, probably risking my life to get a video. Uh, but you can see how these trees are just furiously waving back and forth. When I was a kid, I used to think that the trees waving were creating the wind. Baby! <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the sea level pressure and it shows the anomaly in pressure, the blue being low pressure anomaly and the high uh, red being a high pressure anomaly. And of course this wild and woolly Kona low provide a, a, a lot of uh, uh, very, very strong winds and uh, enhanced surf. Not only that, but it set a record for Mauna Kea. The, the uh, winds were over 150 miles an hour on Mauna Kea. In fact, one sensor actually registered over 190 miles an hour so before it blew off. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a rough place to be. Uh, I was staying the night uh, up here in Kapa'a and the beach looked like this in the afternoon. So this was on the 9th of February. And the following morning, uh, it looked like this. So this was the 10th. So a lot of sand moved in a very short amount of time, which I thought was an interesting observation with this, this type of a system. And here's this uh, snow down to 6,200 feet. So. And the entire island of Maui was without power. That may be what you remember more than anything, right? That there was no power for maybe a week or more. Do you, do you all remember this case? This, now, now, now that I mention that? And the snow? Yeah, if you had a helicopter, you could do some skiing maybe. Um, so one of the things that I promised to, to do is to talk about uh, hurricanes. And uh, I want to remind you that back in 1992, there was a rather strong storm that hit in, uh, the island of Kauai, and it did a lot of damage. This house in the upper left here is the same as the one that this family is sitting in. So uh, it really blew a lot of stuff away. And it made a dead hit. I mean, it was just centered right on Kauai. Now, the interesting thing is that Maui felt no uh, effects from this storm at all. And uh, Oahu, in fact, just had a few waves, but really didn't have much effect either. So the point is that hurricanes are very, very sm typical uh, Pacific hurricanes are very, very small storms. They have a small core, an eye, which is indicated here uh, by the shading, an eye wall with uh, with the winds being enhanced in the, on the side of the storm that's, that where the wind is in the same direction as the storm motion. So Poipu was really trounced by Iniki, whereas Hanapepe and Waimea were not. Not much damage in those areas. So again, even though the storm itself was pretty sizable, the damage was very surgical. Of course, it did go up and over and it created a lot of damage also in Princeville. And, uh, and, and of course, the storm surge is just on that side where the strongest winds are moving towards the shore. It, it knocked down 90% of, uh, it knocked down 30% uh, of the telephone poles and 90% and of the structures were affected. And that's over 14,000 that were damaged and destroyed. And it affected the economy quite a lot. Uh, a lot of people ended up being displaced and leaving. Storm surges uh, are historically responsible for most of the damage and most of the deaths. And, uh, and that's because the ocean is so incredibly powerful, 
when it, uh, when it comes in. And you can see the debris line in near Poipu on the south shore of Kauai. It took the furniture and parts of the homes and shifted it a quarter of a mile inland and created this nice line that you see here. So it was quite, quite impressive. This is a map of, uh, of Honolulu, and if Iniki had hit Honolulu, uh, it would have done this similar thing. It would have created a storm surge that flooded this entire area, all of Waikiki, uh, and it would have been a real problem. A lot more people involved. Um, One thing that is interesting to look at is the history uh, of storms and their impacts in the U.S. Uh, going through 2005, so this doesn't, that's actually kind of an old graphic, but the general takeaway here is that as storms, uh, well, as, as storms are better forecast, people can get out of the way a little easier. And so there are fewer fatalities in the early storms that were unforecast, that were massive uh, loss of life. But more recently, there's been more warning and generally speaking, less la loss of life. So that's a, that's a, uh, a benefit from science and being able to model these hurricanes. Uh, Nevertheless, sometimes these storms can be incredibly powerful, like Michael last year, which hit uh, Florida and produced this phenomenal uh, devastation as a Category 5 storm. And it's interesting, if you look at the housing changes that happened between 1970 and uh, Michael, this is Michael's path. In 1970, it was mostly rural, but now, if we look at 1990, and here's 2018, there's been a big, big increase in coastal development. And that's one of the reasons why the costs for hurricanes is going up so dramatically. Now, you may wonder, well, what does this have to do with Maui? We never have hurricanes, <laughs> right? When was the last hurricane that hit Maui? Well, here's your answer. The last hurricane that hit Maui was 9th of August, 1871. Yeah, your, your uh, descendants, are, I mean, your ancestors, they would have known about this storm. Uh, it turns out that we, we did a, some study uh, using Hawaii newspapers. Because you, you, you might, you ask yourself, like, how do we know that the storm was here at this time and there at that time and so forth? That, that it, sorry, you can't see where I'm pointing. Uh, the specific circles, how do we know the timing? Well, it turns out that the Hawaiians were <coughs> remarkably literate. They were 95% literate at the time this happened. There, there were more literate Hawaiians than in Hawaii than there were literate Americans in the United States, by far. So the literacy rate was amazing. Uh, and it's because the early Hawaiians, the Ali'i, knew how important language was, a written language. They understood this. And uh, the kings decreed that we're going to build a school every five miles so that a kid doesn't have to walk more than two and a half miles to go to school along the coasts of all the islands. And so from 1820 to about 1840, in a 20-year period, we went from zero literacy to this amazing 95% literacy. So I thought that was an interesting aside. Now, what did the Hawaiians do with their literacy? They started printing newspapers. Every island had newspapers. And they put their cultural lore in the newspapers. They put what was happening with agriculture in the newspapers. And certainly events like volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, and hurricanes. They didn't call them hurricanes. They called them whirlwinds. Um, 
it was all in newspapers. So we have had a bunch of translators going through these newspapers looking for uh, interesting things happening in the past. It's, it's quite, quite remarkable. Well, back to the future. In 2018, we had quite a bumper crop. It was one of the most active se seasons on record. 2015 and, and 1992 were more act active, but uh, 2018 was third. You can see all these tracks. Uh, there's one track that kind of swings around. You can see it swinging around the big island, kind of pointing right up Maui. I don't know if you remember, uh, but let me just say that the, the reason 2018 was so active is because the sea surface temperature was an anomalously warm. It was very warm uh, to the south and east of us. And as a result, hurricanes had favorable conditions. So, that's Lane. And this is Lane's track. It came right up and threatened us and then it kind of went that way. And the question is, you know, how, how did we do? Well, we, well, let's talk about impacts first. Well, this is a graphic from a buoy. It had very strong winds and the pressure dropped to nothing. The storm went right over a buoy. I guess that doesn't tell you how heck of a lot, but this tells you something. It rained very hard on the Big Island. It really rained. Uh, 40 inches, Maui got 16 over on the Hana side, so it was, it was pretty wet over the Hana as well. But uh, more than 40 inches, and it created a, a, a lot of problems for Hilo. Hilo flooded, downtown Hilo. <coughs> um, it was a Category 5 hurricane just to the south of the Big Island, and then it stalled and it just created all this moisture coming up into the Big Island <clears throat> on that side of the storm that is uh, bringing up that southerly flow. So the actual track of the storm is given on the, on the left here. And on the right is what we have uh, from the National Weather Service forecast system. Look where it's trying to put it. Yeah. Do you guys remember this? You, you probably weren't worried, like, yeah, nah, it's not going to hit me. I may never get any hurricanes. This was, uh, you know, at KOHN uh, 2, and, and I went on, and actually I talked with, with her. Um, she's a f former student at the University of Hawaii, happy to say. And she was pointing out that, well, we're forecasting surf 15 to 25 feet, storm surge, uh, rainfall 20 inches. This is all for Honolulu, right? And you can imagine what this kind of a forecast does to people. You know, they, they start getting very nervous. They have to sleep with their pets. I mean, it's really... <coughs> um, so... <laughs> Why, why did it behave the way it did? And what can we do to improve our forecasting of these things? So what this shows is the low-level flow, uh, the low-level steering flow. At, uh, and you can see that it, the low-level steering flow is taking it away from the islands. And this is a, a, a later time. It's, again taking it away from the islands. Now the high level steering flow, sort of the, the upper part of the storm, is taking it straight to Maui. I wonder if I should, I think I've got a, a laser pointer here. I could even point. So the flow is coming up like this. And, uh, and that's why the model is taking it up right over Maui at least some of the solutions. Um, and this is at a later time, and you can see that it's still kind of taking it towards the islands. Not a good thing. Now there's something called wind shear. 
Wind shear is the magic bullet that kills hurricanes. And I'm going to describe that a little bit. Um, the wind shear was stronger as the storm moved towards the Hawaiian Islands. And it's the difference between the low level flow and the high level flow. We have a Hadley circulation here where the low level flow is from the uh, northeast, typically, or east, east northeast. The high level flows from the southwest. If you go outside today and you look at the high clouds, they're kind of coming up from the southwest, and the low level flows from the northeast. That's wind shear. That's what saves us. And uh, the wind shear was really quite strong. This is strong wind shear here, and increasing wind shear. There's the storm. And let me show you what the wind shear does. So this is the storm dying. And what happens is early on you get the upper level circulation there. And then the lower level circulation come, becomes visible at the very end. It's down in here. And so the upper level circulation is taken that way. And the low level circulation is taken this way. And you are decapitating the hurricane. So that's what we want. Now, how do we get a, a hurricane model to do this? This is a, a simulation from my group at the University of Hawaii, a high resolution um, hurricane model that's run on a supercomputer. And you can see that it's taking the storm right over Maui. So this was not a happy solution because it was wrong. So what can we do to make this better? Well, it turns out that the problem is every time you start the hurricane, it has to create the hurricane in the model. And that's what is, is shown on this side over here. All these drops in pressure. This is pressure over here. And so you're essentially starting from no hurricane and you're creating a hurricane. That's problematic. So we want to get rid of that. We want to have a system that is more continuous. So each run needs time to spin up. And if you have a lots of data, added data that you can put in, aircraft, soundings, satellite motion winds, now, and you put that in um, continuously. Every four hours, you're running the computer and you use the last uh, simulation from four hours ago, which is pretty good, to initialize your new, uh, your new run. And this is what happens. It works. You can get that wind shear and, uh, and get the storm to kill, and you no longer have those, those dropouts all the time. It's just smooth. So it works, and, and that's uh, kind of fun. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about climate change. I mean, I, I, in the introduction, I showed this ice melting. You've all seen that carbon dioxide is going up and that the temperature is going up, the, the global mean. I want to say a little bit about climate. You know, what is it that controls our climate? Basically, it is the balance between the incoming and the outgoing radiation. The incoming radiation is coming in from the sun. The outgoing radiation is the infrared radiation that's leaving the Earth. We are all radiating, and we, the amount of radiation we emit depends on our temperature. And the Earth, as a whole, radiates in four dimensions, out in every direction uh, all the time. So that outgoing radiation uh, balances the incoming radiation. That defines our climate, so that's pretty simple. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that weather is our mood and climate is our personality. Climate is the integration, if you will, it's the accumulation of all the daily and seasonal weather events. And that can include hurricanes. If you want to do climate science 
correctly, you have to have hurricanes in your climate model, which, may, of course, is, is a problem. So incoming radiation and outgoing radiation. Uh, and these are some of the things that, uh, that affect climate, like uh, solar output changes and surface characteristic changes and so forth. And there's lots and lots of different indications that we are seeing warming. It's not just the global mean temperature. It's the ice that's melting. It's the glaciers that are melting. We're getting gradual sea level rise. There are a lot of things that are changing um, that, that we can measure. A lot of people wonder, you know, why it is that we are pointing at the burning of fossil fuels rather than volcanoes as far as the source of this greenhouse gas, the carbon dioxide. And it turns out that if you, if you have carbon dioxide at the surface, it gets bombarded by cosmic rays and it becomes an isotope. So if you have carbon dioxide that's coming from deep within the Earth, that carbon di dioxide is, has very few isotopes. So if you pump a lot of carbon dioxide into the air, the isotope ratio is going to go down. The number of isotopes is going to drop. And that's what's shown in this graph here, that the isotopes are dropping. And that's a smoking gun. That means that we know that the carbon dioxide in the air is coming from the burning of fossil fuels. Another question is, why is carbon dioxide the thing that we're focusing on and not some of these other things? In fact, uh, one of the very most powerful greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is, is guess what? Anybody know what I'm thinking of? Water vapor. Water vapor. We're all breathing water vapor out as we're sitting here. Water vapor, uh, if you would put the water vapor on this graph, it wouldn't fit, but it would be right here. It stays in the atmosphere about two weeks on average. It cycles in and out very quickly. It evaporates from the ocean, it turns into a cloud, it rains out. It has a very short life in the atmosphere. So it's here and it goes way off the chart. But the problem is, because it's so short in its cycling time, it can't affect climate 100 years out. You need something that stays in the atmosphere if you want to affect climate change, and that's this guy. The reason carbon dioxide is important is one, we, we put a lot of it in the atmosphere, even though it's still parts per million, and people wonder, how can parts per million possibly have an effect? Well, it's like putting a thin blanket on your bed. You know, maybe it's a thin blanket, but it's still gonna cause uh, there to be more warmth at the surface. And it stays in the atmosphere for centuries. So the, the next question is, okay, so there's a bit of warming, how do we know uh, that it's because of fossil fuel burning and not, and, 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 uh, and there's been careful calculations done. The, the black dots here are the, the climate actual um, temperatures, <clears throat> that global temperatures. So they're a bit noisy, but they're going up. And uh, the gray, is the gray line is the forcing all all of the different aspects taken together the uh, the red line is the most important is, is the greenhouse gases uh, the volcanic impact is given by this line with these bumps going downward cooling due to volcanic eruptions and uh, we have uh, some other things here um, I'm trying to think of what they are oh there they are <coughs> So different factors. Solar, solar has almost no impact. There has been, we, we measured the sun very carefully. There's a lot of solar astronomers out there. In fact, there's a telescope uh, on Haleakala that points at the sun and does nothing else. It just looks at the sun. 
we know how much radiation is hitting the Earth from the sun. And this is all past data. Um, and the, the answer is that 100% of the warming is human caused. Because everything else causes cooling. Just about everything else causes cooling. All right. Now here's an interesting observation. This is the summertime temperatures. You, t you subtract the mean, so you get the distribution of colder versus warmer in kind of a bell-shaped um, figure. And this bell-shaped uh, distribution, as you can see, has gone from this here, in 1950 to this shape uh, in 2011. If you do this for the entire globe, and I have that animation too, it does the same thing. It, it's, it's a gradual shift. I've got an animation that goes from 1850, and it, it only uses observations. It doesn't use any satellite, doesn't use any, just uh, surface observations and, and from ships and so forth. And it does the same thing. What are we seeing here? We are seeing a gradual displacement of uh, the temperatures to becoming a little bit warmer. But the other thing we're seeing is quite a difference in terms of the distribution of the extremes. There's a lot more records on the warm side being broken. When you hear that uh, Paris hit 110 degrees, that's that's one of these guys over here. Now, occasionally you'll have a cold um, anomaly happen too, which is one of these. And that's probably what happened in February when we had that cold snow. We still are getting cold anomalies. Now this is um, Hawaii. It's from 1971 to 2000 and it does the same thing. It takes out the mean and it shows the warming that we're experiencing here. Okay, so this is just to illustrate this idea that, okay, the, the temperature is gradually getting a little warmer in the mean, but we are getting more variance, a little more variance. And that's an interesting aspect of what the climate's doing. Now, another thing, if we want to talk about storms and droughts, this is the diagram that explains how water behaves in a warmer climate. If you have a particular temperature of 70 degrees here, that's 30 degrees, uh, 20 degrees C, 70, about 70, and this one is more like 90, uh, if the water vapor amount is kept the same, you're going from 50% relative humidity to 28% to relative humidity. So the, the humidity is dropping. Right? So if you are away from the oceans and your temperature is going up, your relative humidity is dropping and that, that contributes to not getting as much rain in, in drought conditions. On the other hand, if you are near an ocean and that ocean sea surface temperature is going up, then the ocean controls the dew point temperature and it controls this, the size of this. So if the ocean gets warmer, this is going to get bigger. So if you're near the ocean, you're going to have more water vapor. Uh, hmm, well, droughts and wildfires, that kind of makes sense. I don't want to belabor that point, but um, sea level rise. We could, uh, we, maybe we need to build some walls. <coughs> uh, whoa. Pardon me, I guess I can't look down and talk. Uh, so it turns out that this, this little blanket that we're putting on the planet, which is carbon dioxide, which distributes itself very nicely across the entire planet through the circulation of the atmosphere, even if we put most of it in at cities, it mixes out very nicely. And you can see that from the data that we collected uh, at Mauna Loa. The Mauna Loa Observatory has a beautiful timeline for carbon dioxide. And it's a little blanket and most of the energy is going into the ocean. Of, of the downward welling radiation from the atmosphere, the surface heats a little bit, but the ocean 
is taking most of that energy. But the ocean has such a large heat capacity that it doesn't change temperature very fast. So these are the temperatures in the ocean, the mean temperature. It's going up a little bit, but not as much as the air temperature is going up, even though the ocean's taking up most of the energy. It's an interesting dichotomy. The ocean's taking 90% of this heat, but it's only warming a little teeny bit. But that's a bit concerning uh, because the ocean temperature drives the dew point temperature, drives how much humidity is in the ocean. And this is the humidity line. It's, it's a, a special thing called total precipitable water. So you take all the water in the atmosphere and, and drop it to the ground and measure that uh, and, then, and then plot it on a graph. And this is from 1990 to you know, 2018. And you can see El Nino's in here very strong El Nino in the late 90s, and in 2015 it was a strong El Nino. Warmer ocean, more moisture in the atmosphere, and uh, in that I'm going to talk next about how that relates to hurricanes. <clears throat> this is kind of a fun picture. Um, it's alto cumulus that's lit from below by the sun, but on on uh, social media they blamed California wildfires for this. And it turns out it was a grad student in my department that took the photograph, and, uh, which was just a coincidence. But I found this and I thought, oh, what, a, what an incredible photograph, but it can't be true. So I checked it and then found out that it, it was just, somebody had grabbed it and put that title on it. So, you got to be a little careful. You don't want to believe everything you read uh, online, that's for sure. <clears throat> so this was false news. That is just the sun underneath an alto cumulus deck. Boy, look at how flat this hurricane is. You think of hurricanes as being very deep and tall and all the rest, but actually the atmosphere is very, very thin. So there's no way for the hurricane to be very tall. Can't happen. But nonetheless, hurricanes have an amazing amount of power, despite the fact that they're flat. But look at how tiny this, this atmospheric, it's like taking an onion and you know, blowing on it and the condensation from your breath on the onion would be you know, the ocean. And the atmosphere is just a little teeny thing on top of that. They, 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 we, we take for granted that we think that the atmosphere is really thick, but it's not. Uh, hurricanes have a spiral rain band structure and then they have, it has a uh, symmetric eye. So that's what they look like. And they, they decrease in intensity with height. The strongest winds and the heaviest rain are in the bottom. Um, and you can tell something about the strength of the hurricane simply by looking at the temperatures. This is an infrared image that tells you the temperature of the storm. <clears throat> and this was Patricia, 215 miles an hour when it made landfall in Mexico, strongest storm in the Western Hemisphere. <clears throat> and here are some other storms, very strong storms. Colder the cloud top, the stronger the storm. So that's helpful. We can, from satellite, gauge a little bit. If it's a very well-organized storm, we can tell something about how strong it is. And what does it take to build a hurricane? Well, you need to have warm ocean because it it, the energy source is from the water vapor that evaporates off the ocean surface. So the key is the sea surface temperature. The next thing you have to have is some kind of way to gather all that humidity in one place. And if you have low pressure, then you have circulation and you have spiral winds going inward. And that also gives you a conservation of angular momentum, kind of like a tetherball going around a pole the winds will spin up as they move inward. <clears throat> then you need thunderstorms. Uh, you don't want to have wind shear, so you need small wind shear, because otherwise the storm gets blown apart. You want all that moisture in one place. And you have to be somewhere away from the equator because uh, you need to have circulation. And if you're right on the equator, there is no spin and the air just goes straight into low pressure. There's no rotation. 
So you can't build a hurricane at the equator. Um, this is the, the key to getting a strong hurricane. It turns out that you need to have a sea surface temperature of 26 degrees. That's right here. And currently, those, the warmest sea surfaces are about 30 degrees, which is right there. So between 26 degrees and 30 degrees, this little bit is the difference between a Category 1 hurricane and a Category 5 super hurricane. We're talking only four degrees centigrade, that's about eight degrees Fahrenheit, for all that change in intensity. And if you look at sea surface temperature, that's all down here, and then over here you have the pressure at the bottom of the hurricane, there's a match. The strongest hurricanes with the lowest pressure occur where the warmest sea surface temperatures are. And that's completely understood because hurricanes are Carnot heat engines. And uh, Carnot heat engine, it, it uh, thrives on, on this temperature difference between the surface and the stratosphere at the top of the storm. That temperature difference uh, defines the efficiency of the storm. <clears throat> so if you get a warmer sea surface, it gets uh, more intense. And you can kind of see, this is a hot spot over here, a lot of hurricanes, there's, there's warm water here, uh, and then there's some warm water down in here. So, and of course, south of the equator, you get warm water too. Uh, over here, you don't have warm water. So Brazil's only seen one hurricane, uh, but generally speaking, not too much. And Hawaii, luckily, is kind of in the middle here who are saved by cooler water and wind shear. Wind shear kills the storm. So here's Hawaii. This is where most of the storms form. And then we tend to have storms that travel south of us, which is not a bad thing because then it enhances the trades and we get some cool air. Not a bad situation. <clears throat> we don't like them to come up north of us because that's what happened with Izel, and we had all this humid, yucky weather the last couple days. Now, it turns out that as the sea surface temperatures are warming, when the uh, sea surface temperature warms, the, the, it turns out the hurricanes are tracking a little farther from the equator. If you look at the time when they're the strongest, they're farther from the equator than they used to be. Uh, and, and you, can, you can track that, and you can use a climate model to simulate hurricanes nowadays. And what you find is that they're going to be tracking closer to Hawaii. So that's a, that's a projection from a climate model, and you probably say, well, climate models are fiction. And I'm not going to disagree with you because climate uh, science is very much in its infancy. But I kind of like to say, you know, you're driving in the fog and there's rumors that there's a cliff up ahead. <laughs> I mean, does it make sense to just slow down a little? That's my attitude. <clears throat> Actually, I've sped up because I, have, I drive an electric car now, and they are so fast. I have to put mine on chill mode or I get car sick. But it's really nice to think about driving, uh, well, ideally, an electric bike. Uh, but if, if, if you feel like you need air conditioning, um, then I guess an electric car is the way to go. Because as the electric grid becomes greener, you essentially, you know, and if you have solar panels on your roof, you're, you're not contributing to this, this problem. <clears throat> okay, well this just says that uh, in recent years, we've been getting some very expensive storms. <clears throat> but that's, I guess, kind of out of left field. But what about the, the ocean? 
And since this is the Ocean Center, I wanted to turn things back and talk a little bit about the ocean. This was uh, Wakala, a Category 5 hurricane last year. And it passed over this island. And this is the after photograph. Ah, pretty impressive what a hurricane can do to a, an island. Just eliminate it altogether. And it's not likely that this, this uh, island's going to come back. Well, that kind of is a segue to the issue of uh, sea level rise. And we have seen the impacts of sea level rise. It's, it's difficult to calculate sea level rise because you have to know what the land is doing. Could it be that the land is going up because of glacial rebound? Or maybe the land is sinking because uh, there's lava being poured on top? There, it's, a, it's a problem. So the best way to measure sea level rise is to do it from space where you have an external reference frame and where you get the whole globe and you get everything at once and you can measure the sea level rise. And we've been doing this uh, now since uh, the early 90s uh, with a series of different instruments. And what they are essentially are radars that are pointing down and they get an echo back and the time tells you what, where the surface is. And from that, they can calculate sea level rise. And it's been about three millimeters a year. So in 100 years, you get 300 millimeters. But if there's a little bit of acceleration in that, then uh, in 100 years, you might have more. This is uh, tide gauges in Hawaii. Here's Kahului. You can see it's a, a gradual upward trend, about uh, 2.5 centimeters per decade, <coughs> 250 millimeters per century. And this is uh, Honolulu. Um, very slow, gradual rise, but the problem is that you also have these tides that come in, and when you get a pool of warm water, warm water takes up just a little bit more space, and you get the king tide on top of a pool of warm water, and all of a sudden, you're getting your water coming right into the city. And Honolulu's been really impacted by that quite strongly. And of course, places on the North Shore. Um, and the, the reaction from homeowners is, is usually, well, my property is, my little lot is worth $5 million. I've got to harden that shore. I've got to protect this little bit of land that I have. And they do this. Um, and you can see the beach is eroding on that side, but it's not eroding here, but you've lost your beach, right? Hardening of the shore, you lose the beach. They did this in New Jersey. They hardened the shore, and New Jersey, large stretches of New Jersey doesn't, don't have beaches anymore. And we have lost 25% of our beaches on Oahu and 30% on Maui since uh, the 60s. So it's been, it's an interesting problem, and, and uh, we might want to pay attention um, to how it is that we, as a, as a society, as a community, how, how we deal with our beaches. Do we want to have beaches? Another issue is uh, with warming oceans is, is this effect on corals, and coral, coral bleaching. Um, we have coral bleaching in, in Hawaii. And there's some interesting research going on at HIMB, Hawaii Institute for Marine uh, Biology, <clears throat> on Coconut Island, uh, where they have discovered that there are some corals that are very resilient to warming. And they are developing these corals, and they're going to try to seed them out in places where there's been uh, degradation of the reef by uh, global warming or by uh, warming temperatures. So the threat for, for bleaching um, is, is increasing in time. Um, 
And I guess that's another issue that we can, we can think about. Ocean acidification is a different issue. As carbon dioxide uh, increases in the atmosphere, it, gets, it does uh, dissolve in the oceans. And as, when it does so, you get um, an acidification of the ocean. Um, and you can see the, this from uh, the Aloha, from this uh, station Aloha. It's the Hawaii uh, Ocean Time uh, Series experiment. The, the National Science Foundation didn't like it when the proposal, the, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series exper experiment. It's HOTS X. NSF said, no, you can't have that. Station Aloha. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Very off color. But, but scientists tend to be a little perverse sometimes. So, so here we have, um, you know, various things. The carbon dioxide is, is growing, going up and, and the pH is, is dropping. pH is the measure of acidity. And when you get lower pH, it's more acid. So this is a, a time series of the acidification of the ocean. And it's from 1989 to 2010. It, it's continuing to be uh, measured. Um, so the problem with this is that it causes this acidification and it doesn't allow uh, for the formation of shells as easily. So it affects all the creatures that want to create calcium carbonate for their seashells. Higher acidity makes that harder. So that's a problem. So what to do? I want to wrap this up now. Um, I came here by jet and, and, and I paid for it myself. So I'm here as a donation to the Marine Center um, but I feel guilty that I jumped on a jet to come here spewing all that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So what am I going to do? Yeah, well, I'm going to plant a tree. We have, um, it turns out, the perfect mechanism for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it's a tree. Um, did you know that we share 40% of our DNA with trees? And if we could just slow down a little, we might even learn how to talk with trees because trees are very good at speaking to each other. You think I'm kidding, but that's what science is showing. Trees speak to each other. We need to learn how to speak with trees. And all you have to do is plant this many trees to go from being a bad guy to being balanced. It, for me, it's about 15 trees a year that I have to plant. Uh, I have a backyard, I've planted that up. Now I have to go elsewhere to plant trees. And where do I go? I go and help these guys uh, and here you can see some of the trees we planted. Um, and Maui has this opportunity too. Other things that we can do, I think we should, we should support fusion research. Fusion is where you take deuterium and tritium and you fuse them together and you end up with, with helium and a neutron there. It's a clean process that gives you endless energy because we have lots and lots of these things. And we know how to do this because we've done it with uh, hydrogen bombs. It's just that hydrogen bombs are a little uncontrolled, you might say. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how... That's fusion, not fission. Hydrogen bombs are fusion. fusion. Yeah, hydrogen bombs are fusion, fusion reactions. Yeah, and, and we just need to control it. Uh, and we're pretty darn close. 
from what I understand, and, and the, the technology is driving this down in size so that we can have neighborhood fusion reactors. They don't produce lots and lots of radioactive material because it's a fusion reaction. It's not a fission reaction. Fission produces radioactive materials. So this is really exciting. Uh, the other thing we need to do is improve our batteries because if we had, could store the energy better, we got plenty of energy from the sun. We just, the problem is during the day we generate all this energy and at night we need to use it so we need to have something to bridge that. So there's, but there are solutions. Um, I just wanted to throw this out there. I'm not saying everybody has to become a vegetarian necessarily, but if you reduce your meat consumption, you will definitely drive this back, and that'll be helpful. Uh, and then think about how it is that you move around. <laughs> Bikes are really a good way to move. This is the Netherlands, uh, where I was born, actually. I was born in the Netherlands. I came to the United States when I was three years old, so I'm an immigrant. Uh, and, and, Ill, and I, I was a legal alien. I had a little teeny green card. And, uh, and I lost my bike this day. <clears throat> anyway, I'm a US citizen now, and I've got uh, security clearance with the, with the military, so you can feel safe. Ah, Maui still has that magic, and thank you all very much for coming tonight.